I'm Duff. Uh, I have the pleasure of being the uh, head mixologist and ambassador. Actually, I don't even know what my job title is anymore. It constantly changes, but uh, for a year year one in spirits. Uh, and for the last 12 years, probably longer, but I don't like to age myself that much. Um, and I'm really excited to be here today because, and this is, sorry, before I go any further. Now, this is Doug. I like to call him the Craggle. Uh, yes. <laughs> but it is Craggle. I, I was like, come on, please tell me your name is Craggle. Um, because the Craggle, you know, is just an awesome title. Um, like my, but Doug is the uh, national ambassador for Dickel. Um, so we became instant friends that way because it was just an, it's just an awesome spirit. So I was very excited to do the seminar. I came up with the idea because I just really like going to Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow, if I go to Nashville, if I get to do a whole seminar about Tennessee whiskey, I not only get to drink Dickel, hang out with Doug, but actually bring him there when I went. No. You're always traveling, he's always on the road. Um, but I also get to go to Nashville, which is pretty badass. Um, so we wanted to do a seminar, you know, Dickel has been around, but most people don't know a lot about Dickel. Um, it's kind of been like the, young, the forgotten child of uh, Tennessee whiskey. Um, but what is this thing we like to say at Dickel? Something about if you don't know. If you only know Jack, you don't know. Yeah, that's it. If you don't know Jack, wait, no. If you only know Jack, you don't know Dickel. There you go. There you go. I always mess it up somewhere along the line. I love it. I have a t-shirt though to remind me, but it's on the back. Um, <laughs> So anyway, but uh, Tennessee whiskey, you know, for most people, you know, we think of American whiskey, we think it was founded, we always think about Kentucky, right? That's, you know, where most people think about distilling and American whiskey. But really, uh, the roots of American whiskey, they are founded in Kentucky, partially right, but a lot of it comes from the Ap Appalachian Mountains and from Tennessee. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk a bit about where our history comes from or the roots of American whiskey. Um, and how that really influenced the rest of how we're drinking today and how we're uh, really developing American whiskey today. So we're going to talk a little bit about history and we're going to do a little bit of drinking and then we're going to talk a little bit more history and a lot more drinking. Yeah. Sound like a plan? <laughs> All right. So um, the Scotch-Irish. Now the Scotch-Irish are not the Scottish and then the Irish. They actually are one combined uh, race. Um, basically, back in the uh, early 1700s, as we all know, in the 1600s, actually, the English, well, they were taking over everything, right? So they were in America, they were, uh, you know, in Scotland, they were in Ireland, they, you know, they pretty much were the conquerors of the world. But in Scotland and Ireland, they had a really strange thought. They said, you know what, we want to really appease the Scottish lords. They're really complaining and bitching. So we, they gave them a bunch of land uh, in Ireland. Uh, and they really believed that the Irish people were very wild. If you've met my husband, you'll know that's true. Um, <laughs> and they figured if they brought the more civilized Scottish people to Ireland uh, and gave them their land, that they would then, you know, quell the uh, wild nature of the Irish people. Um, so what happens, which, which naturally happens with all people, they get merged together, they start to mate. <laughs> Um, they eventually have children, but what happens is, so they form almost a new race, it's the Scotch-Irish. But they're also looked down upon in their own country. The Irish don't want them, um, so they actually start doing things like raising their rents and other things so that they kind of make it very difficult for them to make a nice living. Uh, and then the English don't want them because they're not Presbyterian, so they're not really welcome in their own land. Um, so they eventually do what a lot of people did back then, and they moved to America to start a new, uh, a new life. So they moved to America. Uh, you know, as we know, the English were very dominant in America in our early history. Um, and actually, there are some, there's actually a famous uh, English colonel who actually learned how to make uh, corn whiskey. He actually learned you know, about corn from the Indians, and then he learned how to make corn whiskey. He wrote back to it to the English colonies. The irony was he was then then killed by the Indians. <laughs> um, but um, so basically, they settled in. And most people settled in on the East Coast because obviously that's where it closest to the waterways. They settled into Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and things of that nature. Um, like many people, they start growing corn. They bring things from their home country. They think, bring things like barley and rye. Uh, they'd never seen corn before. It did not exist to them. Um, it was something you know that the natives had. They didn't really grow it or eat it. Um, and they start making whiskey because what do you do when you can't, you know, it starts to go bad. If you have an abundance of something, you can't really store it, they didn't have refrigeration, so they start making whiskey from it. They also, it's easier to transport in liquid form than it is when it's in cold form. 
but they're using it as a bartering system because they don't have really a lot of money. Nobody's really making money. It's more like they make whiskey and you barter it for a horse, you know, or you know, some food. Um, but the Revolutionary War comes, as you know. Uh, we beat the English. Yay! Sorry for the English people out there. Um, but so George, now we're in debt. We have the very first government, right, for America, and George Washington is president. But we're poor. We're really poor. So he decides to put our first taxation, which is we actually fought the English to get away from taxation. Remember that statement? You know, no taxation without representation. So we start rebelling against it, and they keep sending like tax people into our town, and we keep tarring and feathering them. And I'm sure you guys have heard this story before. Um, and eventually, George Washington gets a little pissed off. He wants his money. He does. He wants his money. He's sick of people coming back tarred and feathered. Um, and he really, it's not nice, and he's not getting any money, and the people are really much saying, fuck you. Like, it's not going to happen. And we don't have any money, because we don't sell our whiskey, we use it for trading. So, like, what do you, it's like trying to get blood out of a stone. It doesn't exist. So, but eventually, he does something very heroic, actually. He actually um, forms the very first time, actually, George Washington ever called the troops together at the Revolutionary War was for this. He had never actually called the troops together for anything. So he was actually, it's almost like an experiment to see if they would actually listen to him. He was his first act as a commander in chief, and they did. And they marched into Pennsylvania, and pretty much people said, well, this isn't worth dying for. <laughs> uh, you can win. You know what, we're, you can have it, we're gone, we're not gonna rebel anymore, we're just gonna move west, because nobody wants to go west, so we're gonna go west. So they do, so they move out um, to the Appalachian region, uh, most people don't make it there. They probably die from Indians and starvation on the way there. Um, so they kind of walk into West Virginia. That's where they first settle. Um, and then there's a, the very first law in Kentucky because the West Virginians really want to push forward and they want to expand their land. So the first law, so they basically put it in the place in Kentucky, which is where they said, okay, well, if you're going to uh, move forward and you're going to start settling these lands, we need to have some, pretty much some guidelines. So they put into law the cabin patch, uh, cabin, sorry, the cabin and corn patch law, which says you get like 400 acres of land, you have to plant corn, and you have to build the cabin. So they move forward into Kentucky, they do that, um, and they do start distilling, you know, they start using corn, they start distilling, but a lot of people started moving even further than that. They didn't want to get stuck in Kentucky, they actually moved to Tennessee, because Tennessee was actually known as the land of milk and honey. It was known for its rich soil, it was known for its clean water, it was known for the woods uh, that had a lot of game. Um, so they wanted to move to milk, you know, the land of milk and honey. So they moved forward into Tennessee. And of course, you know, they bring their distilling with them. Um, they realize that they are, you know, planting crops, and they're still planting at this point for what they know, which is they know rye, they know barley, um, so they're still planting this, even though it doesn't grow. It's a really bitch, the rises thing. And they're still looking at Indian corn, but it's Indian corn. It's not something they really want to adopt yet, but they realize it's something very necessary. Um, so they start distilling. Uh, one of the very first distilleries was uh, the Evan Shelby's, uh, which is one of the first, uh, actually on record, uh, distillery in Tennessee, which was in existence by 1771. Um, they are starting to, because they actually are registered with the government. Not everybody's a lot of people moonshining, but a lot of people are registered because they don't have to pay tax yet. So they don't, and the taxes they do have to pay are very low. So they're making rye whiskey. They're still producing rye whiskey. Um, and I always love this fact. There's 61 stills for less than 4,000 people uh, in Davidson County. So they were drinking a fuckload. Because <laughs> um, life on the prairie, as, we, uh, as you've seen in many movies, was not fun. You know, like, he died pretty early. So, you know, you know, I think it kind of relieved a lot of stress for them. Um, well, speaking of stress, and also speaking of drinks, uh, in front of you, and also um, rye whiskey, uh, you actually have a drink, uh, which is a twist on a classic. Um, so it's the Scott Claw, but instead of grenadine, I actually replace it with uh, raspberry syrup. Instead of dry vermouth, we use a little Lillet, which I think the Lillet Blanco is spelled wrong, and I apologize for that. It's just Blanc, isn't it? Yeah, sorry about that. Um, but anyway, so this is the cocktail you have in front of you. It's not regular raspberry syrup, though, Alex, wherever you are. It's actually um, Moment raspberry syrup, so it's not exactly what I wanted, but it's pretty good. So cheers. Cheers. And Doug's going to tell you a little bit about Dickel Rye. 
microphone and everything. Yes, you do. All right. Um, I don't want to catch you in. All right, there we go. Um, this is fantastic. Oh, thank it's you actually, for this, Elaine. Actually, yeah. we, we fixed it. We're going to stop. So, you know, we're doing, as far as the tasting that we have in front of you guys, too, we are, we're tasting all of, uh, we're going to taste the number one, eight, 12, and barrel select. Okay, those are all the, our Tennessee whiskeys, all of our sour mash. But we, I did want to just touch briefly on the George Nickel Rye, which came out two years ago. Um, so this is actually 95% rye, but what's very unique about it, and I think what comes out with this drink too, where it's, it's a lot lighter in style than what you get with the rest of the family. So when we taste the rest of the family, one of the things you'll, you'll definitely pick up on is the fact that um, Tennessee whiskey has this lighter style to it, a lighter finish, it's definitely sipping whiskey. And uh, this rye, because we actually filter it through Tennessee sugar maple, which we'll talk about a little bit later as far as the Lincoln County process, <coughs> We do that with our rye whiskey as well, so it, it kind of pulls off that finish, and for me, it's, it's, it's one of few sipping rides. It definitely can get overpowered easily, but I think it also makes for a really nice balance when the drink is, drink is made well. So it's 95% rye, 5% malt barley. You would expect that to be a high rye content rye still, which it is, but it doesn't necessarily drink like that. So when you use it, if you guys are familiar with using it, you'll see that it needs to be balanced out a little bit more. Um, it is 90 proof, and that's one of the things you'll find with some of ours as well, is that I think that they don't, Tennessee whiskeys don't necessarily, necessarily drink as high as the proof actually is. It's a little bit softer and it's a little bit lighter, and that's the style that we want to go walk away with. You know, as we do this whole seminar and everything else, the one thing I know that is, is my personal goal and what, what I want to kind of everyone to walk away with if you walk away with like two things and that is that Tennessee whiskey as opposed to Kentucky as opposed to bourbon which is a lot of the conversation right now within American whiskey should be looked at as a lighter style it should be looked at as sipping whiskey there's a reason why they filter through charcoal there's a reason why we do those processes so I want to be looking at these as appellations within the American whiskey category and we can actually say that different regions are going to produce something that has a specific quality to it. So I leave, I leave all the bold, you know, oak barrel kind of boldness that comes out of bourbon to Kentucky and allow us to have that softer sipping style. And I think that rye really does fit into that category. Now, Doug, it's also, it's so, um, we're going to talk about the Lincoln County process, but it's also because it, you are doing the Lincoln County process after to an age. Yeah, so, uh, you know, typically, we, and we'll talk about it, but it, it does, we, you normally we do the Lincoln County process happens right after distillation. So we'll cut it down to a specific proof and then we'll put it past it through the charcoal. But for this uh, rye, we actually allow it because the rye in general kind of interacts with oak a little bit differently and you get, you get a bolder flavor that comes out. So I think aging rye, basically just in that pure form, definitely has a nice interaction, and you get that spiciness that people love about rye whiskey, but we actually pull it out after six years, and then we pass it, we still chill it down to 40 degrees and pass it through Tennessee sugar maple. So we're just kind of rounding the edges off and allows it to have this kind of just nice sipping quality on the end of it. Awesome. Yeah. Yes? Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, everybody. I'm gonna try not to spill this one. <laughs> so rye is definitely something that you know was the foundation of what we were all drinking. It's why we're all drinking rye again, right? Because we're going back to all things that were old or now cool again. Um, so we're bringing back old spirits. But corn definitely started catching on. Um, it no longer became known as like, oh, it's just that thing that the natives do. Um, after we wiped out lots of natives, uh, we realized that, hey, they were onto something. Um, this corn stuff is pretty good. Uh, and also it's easier to grow because rye was, and barley and things of that nature, it was, they were still growing it, but it wasn't as easy. It was not as easy to maintain as it was in their old country. The climate, obviously, in America was different. Um, so they really started adapting corn as one of their as their natural crop. Uh, it was easy to grow. Um, it was easy to harvest, and they really started adapting it as part of their everyday life. Um, you know, for those of you, how many people like tequila? Right? Yeah, me too. So just like uh, the the Indians or the uh, native in uh, Mexico, they started adopting the agave plant, like the leaves and the stalks and everything in their daily life, right? They started using every part of the plant as something that they would use, you know, the stalks for their, you know, for the, sorry, the leaves as, you know, the threads and the leaves for like sewing their clothing and things of that nature. They started doing the same thing with the corn. They started actually using the, the cobs, those things to burn. Uh, they would use the, uh, the leaves that they, that were on the stalks actually stuff their mattresses. 
Um, they were using them on their brooms. So it actually became a very essential plant to their everyday living. Um, and eventually, obviously, if you're growing corn, you're eventually going to start just making all your whiskey from corn. So that's how we started actually going from rye whiskey because we realized that corn was just an easier thing to work with. Um, and we started making more corn whiskey. So basically, corn whiskey uh, replaces rye. Uh, and it really does become an essential part of living, and it's all throughout the Appalachian Mountains and all the moonshiners, and this is what they're using. They're just making straight corn whiskey. So, <laughs> Uncle Jesse. Yeah. There, there's Uncle Jesse from one of my favorite shows. I don't know if you want to talk about anything about the moonshine in history. Yeah, a little bit. Why not? Why not? <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's fun because this is good. We transition, I believe, right, right from here. But, uh, you know, if, it, if you guys aren't kind of familiar with, I like to stand, and I feel like I'm short when I sit down. Um, if you're familiar with um, the term in general, I mean, the reason why they were calling this moonshine is because people that were trying to escape taxation anyway that were distilling were actually going up to the mountains and they were doing it by the light of the moon. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory as far as the term, but um, it was to escape some of that. I mean, even though taxation was lighter in, in the frontier than it was in, um, in uh, the more populated East Coast, one of the things you actually find is that the taxation, the way that that whole taxation worked for them too, is that they were going off of the production of your still. If you had a registered still, they were going off of that production, not necessarily what you were, what your output was, but what the capacity of that production was. So if you were a farmer and you had a still and you just needed to turn your crops into, into a way to make some extra money so that it didn't go bad, you would maybe, st you know, you would still maybe two weeks out of the year, maybe a month, maybe two months, well they actually assumed at least four months worth of production and because there was not as many tax men down in the frontier, they weren't able to actually come and measure, they were just going to say, okay, your still can produce this much quantity over a four month period of time, so this is what we're going to tax you on. So in the end, that also pushed people to do it illegally and to, and to find other ways, because all, all they're doing at this point is still just saying, I have grain. I don't want to lose my livelihood with this. I need to find a way to turn it into something that, that is tangible that I can then use for barter for whatever else it is to sell it off. And uh, that did force some people up on the hills to do it and try to escape um, escape the law a little bit, if you will. Good old moonshine. Good old moonshine. Jesse Duke. <laughs> so some other things also discovered at this time. I mean, we always think, you know, we hear sour mash. And I remember when I first started learning about whiskey, and I'm sure you guys got the same way you heard sour mash. It was like this magical term, like, oh, that's a sour mash whiskey. And then as I started learning more about whiskey, I realized they're all freaking sour mash. They're all sour mash because it's like a necessary component of making whiskey. It's a make good whiskey, it should be sour mash. But they started doing this back then. And this is what I also like to relate the old moonshiners, and old whiskey producers, to mezcal producers because Mezcal producers, for those of you guys who like mezcal, right? They, these guys are doing things on intuition, right? They're, they're not really, there's no machines, they're kind of doing things by taste and by look. Well, the same thing with the guys who were making uh, whiskey back in the day. They would literally, and still to this day, they would, well, now that we have machines, but they were, so they discovered that, okay, we're going to make our, our mash and we're going to make our, and they discovered, like, if I just put yeast in there, it's a little sweet. Like, it's just, it's like, it's okay, but it's a little too sweet. But if I take some of the, the first batch and put it into the new batch, then I get this consistent flavor and it's a little more sour and a little more malty and it has a little more flavor. And I like that. that that's good. And the second thing they started learning about how to distill the strength. And uh, I think you actually told me a story about the bubbles, which I didn't know people still do. But uh, and I've seen it's only in a, in a medical thing where people actually look at the bubbles. But distilling the strength so is one of the things they like to do. Because obviously if you distill your tiny little still too high, it's going to blow up if it gets too hot, so that's not good, right? So they would actually take the liquid and they would actually mix it with gum powder and put it on fire. Uh, if it didn't go on fire, then it didn't have enough proof. If it was a too big of a fire, it was too high of a proof, but if it was a blue flame, it was actually just right. Um, but the other thing they would do, once they would bottle it, what consumers still do, and I think you told me about this, is that they actually take it and they shake the bottle like that and you're looking for the bubbles because if it has tiny little bubbles that means it's the perfect amount of alcohol if it has big fat bubbles like rabbit eyes I was described um, then there's not enough alcohol in there and people still do this you told me the story yeah so you know this Dickel one which we'll taste in a minute it's I mean it's fairly we put it out fairly new but 
uh, when, especially when I was in Tennessee and I'm taking this out and I'm going to some of the stores out there and just talking to people, guys would grab it and I would, I would show them the bottle and the first thing they would do with it, still to this day, is they would sit here and they would shake it and they would look at it and be like, ah, yeah, it's not bad. You know what I mean? That was, that was their judge at this point. And I was like, well, you know, I get that for when you have a, a you know, a mason jar that your buddy gave you somewhere and he's like, here you go, and you want to check it out. But, uh, you know, it's still kind of a common practice, especially if you live in areas where shining is still kind of a traditional, it's a cultural kind of thing that you're still, especially in North Carolina, Tennessee, and into West Virginia and places like that, that it's still, people are doing it whether they're supposed to or not. Exactly. We're going to close a little bit of oh, stick away. Go. There we go. Perfect. I have the bottle in my hand. So uh, let's taste our first whiskey, too, uh, which is the George Stickle number one. Uh, it is on your left, and it should be pretty easy to recognize because it's the clear whiskey. So we just talked about moonshine, right? And we were talking, you know, kind of referencing that. But honestly, what I, I do like to say is that this, this isn't a moonshine. If this was a moonshine, we probably weren't, we shouldn't be paying taxes on it. I feel like that's part of it. And moonshine in itself, I think, is, is more of a cultural reference than anything else. It's, it's evoking a feeling. And any, any of the companies that are doing that and have a moonshine kind of quality out there, the reason they are too is because they want to invoke that feeling. They, they're re referencing back to part of a cultural time that has to do with, with whiskey making. Uh, for us, what we wanted to do is we wanted to give people access to what that base of our spirit is, which is why we call it our number one white corn whiskey. Another thing that we're able to do, because Dickel is actually 84% corn, 8 rye, 8 malt barley, that's our mash bill. So anything over 80% corn is technically also a corn whiskey. And out of the definitions for whiskey, corn whiskey is the only one that actually says, as opposed to it must be aged or rested in an oak container. Um, for that definition, it actually just says that if you age it for any period of time, it has to be in a new oak container, an SB aged in an oak container. So corn whiskey is the only classification where you don't actually have to put it in a barrel, um, and you can still put whiskey on the label. So that was, uh, for us, we were invoking that feeling of still being able to say that it's a whiskey, it's still within that category, um, without having to age it at all, as opposed to finding other ways to kind of strip color or to filter it down and get it back to kind of that pure form. Um, but if you guys already tried it, I don't know, but hopefully you have a little bit left, because one of the things I do like to tell people, and Elaine's been talking a little bit referencing mezcal and tequila, which I think is perfect, because when, I, when you drink this, I think it's actually pretty appropriate not to think about whiskey. It's a white whiskey. What do you think of, what's the first thing you think of when you hear the term whiskey? Brown. 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 No. For me, it's oak. It's all those flavors that oak imparts on the whiskey. Those are, no matter how mash bills change, you know, the, the, how long you age it, there are so many different parts of the process that will change one whiskey to the next. But in the end, you have some fundamental flavor profiles that are present in all American whiskey. But with white whiskeys, you don't have those same common flavors. So I think the reason why, personally, that people are kind of standoffish sometimes on white whiskey is because you have this prejudice in the back of your mind that when you think whiskey, you think, oh, you don't try to, but you just do. So when you taste it and you don't get it, you're disappointed without even realizing it. So it's actually better to think more about Blanco tequila, I think, than whiskey when you drink this. It's more about the essence of the source of fermentable sugar. For us, it's corn. You know, whether it's agave, whether it's anything else, whether it's grape, whatever you're using to distill, you know, for white spirits, it's about that purity of what that, what that source is. And I think that's what this is. For us, it's corn. It smells like corn, tastes like corn. It's creamy, but still smooth. This is 91 proof. It goes down a little bit easier than 91 proof, I think, as well, which is also where that Lincoln County process really comes in and filters it out and softens it out. So next time you guys try some white whiskeys, I think it's really important to kind of remove yourself from the category and think more about all those other white spirits that you're drinking. And I think you can evaluate it really well. And it also gives you some creative new ways to use it if you're applying it like other white spirits as opposed to trying to apply white whiskey to whiskey cocktails. Right? right? So. What do you think? It's pretty good. It's very good. Mm -hmm. It allows you to feel the quality of the water a little bit more too. Mm -hmm. It's a mineral thing. You get lost sometimes when you open up. It's really prominent. Right. It's yeah. It's going back to it's it's going back to a little bit of purity with it, and I think that it's it's going to the essence of the spirit, and that's why we waited until now to put it out because we've been making good whiskey, and now it's like all right, now let's give everyone a look at what the start is, what the foundation is, what the essence is, when the things that you can taste there. For me, it's, it's, it's like this experience. When I smell it, I spend enough time at the distillery, 
it, it's like I'm standing in the parking lot of the distillery when I smell this, you know what I mean? It can kind of transplant you to a different place. And if you think that this is the skin without aging, yeah. when did the aging come? <laughs> Where all the magic happens. Where all the magic happens. So speaking of aging, so that was actually, um, the, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so that was the, uh, so the next step actually in whiskey production was about the aging. Um, it was in the early 1800s, it was actually, I love this statement, it was uh, 1798, it was when recognized that the year of bourbon became more civilized. Um, the, uh, the rumor is, and it's never been proven, it was that Elijah Craig um, was the per person who started first aging his whiskey, um, that it was done by accident. Um, he was using it to store his whiskey, and then one day he accidentally uh, charred his wood. Like, how do you accidentally charred your wood? Um, and then he was, <laughs> and then like he had to he had to use it, so he made a barrel, and then he aged it, and then he realized that the whiskey tasted much different. But the thought, is, you have a question? Oh no, I, oh, I had heard the story was that he had been using the barrels to store other things, and they had an off off taste, and so he, so he charred it. Out, sure, to get the out of it. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Because yeah, I heard like I've heard that one, and I've heard like the accidental, and I'm like, all right, maybe he was drinking a lot, and then he had a fire, and then he accidentally overcharged it. That was, the that was the accidental part. Dropped it in. Yeah, just dropped it in. Um, but aging obviously has a huge effect on how the whiskey tastes and the, and the flavor notes that we're going to be tasting uh, in, the, in the next whiskey. Um, and also water. The, the reason why uh, people in the Appalachian Mountains in Tennessee and Kentucky, the reason why they went there is, that, well, the limestone. The limestone uh, built, naturally filters the water, it pulls out the iron, and it produces a cleaner spirit. Um, so it is a essential, and, you know, we all know water, but you can distill anywhere, as we know, like bourbon's being made everywhere around the country, but Tennessee whiskey can only be made in Tennessee. So by 1810, um, there were 14,191 distilleries. It was a lot. Um, they had obviously, they had settled in, you know, they started making roads and houses and farms. Um, 25.5 million gallons of whiskey uh, across the nation. So really, we were a whiskey producing nation, and Tennessee was definitely at the forefront. Um, but obviously with that, because uh, women, we weren't allowed to go into to vote, or go into bars, and now our men folk were getting drunk, um, because they were drinking whiskey like they were beer. Um, we had a little say about that. We're like, okay, well, uh, so they started forming the very first temperance movements, you know, and they were started getting preached to at church, like that's not appropriate. But it didn't really take hold because there were other things happening in our country, which was the Civil War. So basically it started, a little bit of rumblings, but nothing really happened. And the Civil War really did, as we know, you know, justify, our, you know, just demolish our country, but especially the South. So basically, all the distilleries and all the distilleries shut down um, because they had to be put into war purposes. And any grain that they had, they needed to feed the soldiers. So you could not be distilling, even though there was still liquor out there. Actually, they were building distilleries to just keep the soldiers, obviously, supplying them with booze to give them the courage to actually go to war. Um, and basically, you know, it really, obviously, it just decimated the South. So. When the war was over, they you know they needed to rebuild, um, and the fastest way to rebuild, actually the fastest thing they could start selling and producing was whiskey. You know that was the thing that they had. They they knew how to do it. They knew how to do it well. So they actually started building distilleries quite quickly, as fast as they could, because they realized they needed to make money to rebuild um, the country. So that's when these three guys, the big guys, actually came into play. Do you want to? Does anybody know who all three are? Jasper Daniels. So yeah, we have Mr. Dan. Do we do we need the mic? Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't need the mic. You can I like to project. Um, so yes, Mr. Daniels there. We have uh, Mr. Nickel down here, but then we also have Charles Nelson. Was a was another distiller at that time that was very important and just just about as important as as prominent as the other two distillers were at that time um, in Nashville. So. Um, Actually, so Charles Nelson had his Greenbrier Distillery. I don't know if you guys are kind of paying attention to Tennessee right now as well, but the Greenbrier Distillery has just, they've just opened back up and turned the, turned the taps back on, which is pretty awesome. And that's still holding through with the family lineage that um, the brothers that are starting that now uh, are, are family members, descendants of Charles Nelson himself, which is very, very cool. Um, 
And so for George and, and uh, Charles there, they were actually what was really important in Nashville. You had a lot of merchants. It was, it was, a, it was a town where it was a lot of, um, very much a merchant town. So both of them were actually merchants first. Uh, and that's where, that's where they got into the whiskey business. So uh, for Charles Nelson, he had a grocery, basically. But grocers were also your distributors at that time. They were the ones that were distributing. They were buying from multiple sources, or in his case, he was able to open his own distillery and be able to get that out. And that was, if you were involved with the distillery and you had your own shop, then you were more likely to be able to sell more of your product because you were distributing it out. So he had a very prominent um, grocery and merchant shop on 2nd Street in Nashville, which was where everything was happening in Nashville at that time, and uh, was producing a ton of whiskey. Uh, probably, he was probably at that time the biggest mm -hmm. distiller. Um, George also came uh, over at the same time and had his own shop, so George A. Dickling Company was first. He was a merchant before he was actually a distiller as well. Uh, Mr. Daniels had kind of a different past as far as that goes, that he apprenticed under um, a guy by the name of Daniel Call as well, and, uh, and started apprenticing under him, who was already making whiskey before he took over uh, when Reverend Call, I guess, went took his calling. Yes. Um, his that, wife didn't like the fact that he was making whiskey, and eventually his wife won. Right. <laughs> which, which happens, which does happen a lot. Happy wife, uh, happy life. Uh, so, but, for, but, but for Charles and George, they, it was all about selling, and specifically, <laughs> specifically with, uh, you know, uh, with the George Dickel history, um, George... Perfect segue again. Thank you. Um, so George came, came into Nashville, and we only know that he actually came to Nashville in 1855 because he showed up with tax records because he had a shop. And basically, the way I look at George is if, if he could make money doing it, he did it. He had a boot shop, he had his merchant shop, he was a rectifier, he was buying all the farmers and millers whiskey and trying to blend those together to create something that was more palatable for the consumers and all the people in taverns and everything else. Um, and that actually kind of references back as we talk about the number eight and the number 12 as far as recipe numbers versus age statements. Um, but as a lot of you know, guys at that time did, he met a nice lady down from Tullahoma, Tennessee, and her family was already making whiskey. So it was in Cascade Hollow down in Tullahoma, Tennessee, which is about an hour and 15 minutes southeast of Nashville. And uh, that is, uh, they had a distillery, they already had a water source there, and they had a small operation he married her and he's like, all right, well, let's go ahead and pump this up a little bit. This is now the family business and he's marrying in. So he was the one, I look at him and he's an innovator. He was thinking any way to get things done and he did bring some money to the operation. So he, they were basically making their whiskey and he was able to sell it under the George A. Dickel and Company name on 2nd Street in Nashville. And that's really how it all started for him. So it was in, yeah, 1870 that that kind of uh, all got started. I'm talking about uh, the main thing. So also a major thing that also happened during this time was the Lincoln County process, which it was actually discovered by a gentleman named, uh, started creating a gentleman named Alfred Eaton, who also came to, he also started distilling when the big three actually started distilling as well. Uh, but he did something very unique. He, he was the, um, so he was one of the first people to rebuild this distillery after the Civil War. Um, but he never made as big a name as the Greenbrier Distillery or Jack or Dickel. But he's also what we believe is the creator of the Lincoln County process. So he was the first one to discover that by filtering your uh, whiskey through uh, maple wood charcoal that you would get a smoother, cleaner drinking whiskey. So I know there's a lot more to that, Jack. So I'd love you to tell you about what they do at Dickel. So, well, and, and one of the things, too, that you'll actually find is that um, uh, Mr. Eaton actually, so since he was in Tennessee, and that's where the name kind of coins in as well, or there's, there's a lot, there's a couple stories, but I know it was all happening there. But if you, if you look back even farther, people were doing it in Kentucky as well. They were filtering through charcoal. Um, but a lot of the really, really old um, documents that you can go through now, um, actually, I think it was uh, a guy by the name of Mike Beach, if anyone's read his book on bourbon whiskey, uh, he references how um, there's some old distillers that said, after the process, filter through charcoal or coarse sand, which I don't think sounds great. But I mean, it's, it was a matter of they were they were maybe not as practiced yet, so they were finding some sort of filtering agent. But it, it started to be perfected in Tennessee for sure, and Mr. Eaton was the guy who, who uh, really contributed to that. So there's a couple different ways that the process kind of happens. 
Charcoal in itself, right, is a very porous substance. So that's what we want to use, and that's why they do use it. So it's porous from a very visible level. If you take a piece of charcoal and you can see all the ridges in it, but it also goes down to a molecular level, how porous it is. So um, when you activate charcoal, at least on a kind of a pure level, all you're doing when, when you hear the term active charcoal, unless someone uses a chemical process, which is not for anything that is food oriented, um, you are going to basically you're just clearing up the soot. That's as simple as it is, right? So that it is, it's, it's as dry and it's as clear as possible. And then you're going to filter it through. Well, what that's doing is it's stripping out congeners out of the whiskey, mainly oil-based congeners, oil, anything that was oil-based that they wanted to pull out. And um, there's a couple ways to do it. So the most common is basically a drip filtration process to where you have your tank, however size it is, and you're going to put pipes on top of it, and you're going to do a drip filtration. So it's going to have stagnant points of contact, but it's going to basically slowly make its way through the charcoal. It looks like it's really absorbing it, but it's not. The charcoal isn't necessarily absorbing it. It just kind of soaks through into the into the heart of, of that piece of carbon, and then will slowly pass through, and it'll come out the other side, as opposed to kind of saturating. Uh, so that's one process. Now, what George actually did, which was a little bit different, which is on the far right here, as opposed to using an open tank, he actually did a full immersion filtration. So he flooded the tanks. And whether or not that was because he thought it would speed up the process or, or what the reasoning behind it was, um, instead of dripping down, he actually did what was, he would flood the tank with whiskey. So you would actually have 13 feet of charcoal and that whole, there would be full contact, simultaneous surface contact with every piece of charcoal because it would be, the tank would be full. Um, and the other thing that he did that was very unique to their process was he would chill filter it. So we do that, do this today, and the reason why we know that this is what he did was because the records from the merchant shop said that people would come in and they would specifically ask for what they called his winter whiskey. So it was whiskey that he made in the winter time. They liked that better. So when they came into the shop, they'd be like, do you have any of that winter whiskey? That's the one they wanted. So when the, when the distillery was reopened and they went through all of the records and they saw that this was happening, it took them a little time to start looking at all the parts of the process and see where cold, where the cold weather actually affected the process. And the only part that it really had a change in the output was during the filtration. When they chilled that down, if you remember, it's oil-based congeners, right? Well, oil-based things, they're, they're, you know, molecules and everything else, they thicken up as they get colder, it gets more viscous. So then the charcoal is able to grip onto more of it and strip more out. So I think that's what gave that really, really that softer kind of finish down to the whiskey. Yes, sir? What does it add? What does it add? Yeah. It doesn't add anything. It's a completely subtractive process, um, the, the Lincoln County process, which is why, and we have, you know, we'll get to definitions later a little bit, which is why it's, it's still um, debatable whether the Lincoln County process would necessarily negate being able to classify yourself as a bird, because the, the part of that process is you cannot add besides an oak barrel, right? That's, that's, that's part of the definition of a, of a bourbon, but this is a subtractive process. So absorption as it is as a chemical pro as a, a process of filtering through carbon is completely subtractive. Yes? How often um, does the charcoal get changed? Is it like a new batch of charcoal per? No, definitely. So, I mean, for us, we change it about once every four months. It definitely, it, it, it goes by production, right? Because it's more about taste. So they will taste it from the output and say, okay, now it's starting to, it's starting to not be as effective. But to kind of maximize it, you know, that's where that, that um, whole flooding works for us. So I think we're able to use our charcoal a little bit longer. Uh, because we're using all of the surface area. By completely subtractive, have they done any studies on that and proven that it's completely subtractive? Or is well, it yeah, so I mean, I, um, I can't quote some of the, if you want to actually, I can give you some information afterwards. I have a couple um, kind of some papers that people have written as far as the absorption process in general, some of it's for chemical, but it's also just what carbon does to different liquids. And uh, with it, when you read that, you'll see that they, they are saying that it's completely subtracted. If it's completely act, so if, you, if you're activating the charcoal to the point where um, in a pure form where all you're doing is clearing it out and you do that effectively, then it's not adding anything to it. Um, from a visible standpoint, if you look at, um, I have samples of both pre and post charcoal filtration <coughs> whiskey right off the still and then right off out of the leacher, which is what we call our charcoal tanks. 
um, you'll see that they are completely identical. There's no, there's no difference in the, the color, clarity, anything like that. But when you taste them, you'll see that it's, it's not that it adds anything to it, but that it's, it's that finish, it's that mouthfeel, and it's basically that kind of burn that comes at the end of the whiskey is what is really changing it. Yeah. Let's taste some whiskey. Yeah, we got some. Okay. I was yeah. wondering, like, uh, with the sugar maple, is there, is there so a reason? particular reason why it's that as opposed to something else? Yeah, so uh, ma sugar maple is a very hard wood, so I think that the charcoal that it's that is resulting from that is is giving you a nice, very porous uh, charcoal pieces. Now, we burn our own, and most people do. I know Jack makes their own as well, um, and most anybody that's doing the Licky kind of process for the most part that I know of is burning their own and the main reason why you're doing that is because it's the only way to guarantee the type of wood. If you go out and buy charcoal, it's going to be a combination. So it's the only way to guarantee that you know exactly what type of wood and what quality of wood. Because it also, if you think about it, so if you cut down a tree at a certain part of the year, you're going to have more sap, which is going to make it more difficult to have a very pure piece of charcoal when you burn it. Um, and it'll, it'll burn slower and all these things. So um, you can actually, if you contract it out, like we do in Central Tennessee, we'll make sure that they cut it down at the time of the year where you have that um, less sap within the, within the tree itself. Have you or do you know of any other distilleries that have experimented with other like hardwoods? Uh, not, we haven't that I know of. It's been pretty, pretty consistent um, for a long time, but I wouldn't be surprised if people weren't. And I definitely wouldn't be surprised if people didn't do that in the future with how many Tennessee whiskeys are opening up and um, the possibilities that are happening right now within the state of Tennessee for, for whiskey. So it's very possible. I also like the statement, if it's not broke, don't fix it. That's right. How long does it take for a sugar maple tree to grow and um, are you guys doing any active replanting? So with, with the, the people that, I, I don't know how long it takes to grow, but I think that's a really good question and I'm going to find out, um, which is why I love doing seminars because I feel like you always get one question that you get to go back and research. <laughs> um, but I know that the folks that we contract through, which I don't have the names off the top of my head, are the folks that we, that we source the wood from that they, that they do, but I know that they do a reconservation. Um, we're actually looking at doing some replanting in, in our area at the distillery as well, um, kind of some active stuff. Uh, to make sure that we are kind of contributing back whenever we're using up the resources. So you, so, you guys have like one hell of a barbecue every four months? <laughs> <laughs> so we, do, we actually do a, a, a mini competition with all the guys. Only the folks that work at the distillery can do it. But um, it's a very cool bonfire. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's amazing. It's right next to the, to the visitor center. And literally, you can start as close as that projector as they light it. But by the time it's in full blaze, I would have to be at the other end of that, the next room because of how much heat radiates off of it. Um, there's a tree line that runs around it where you'll actually see that they don't grow past a certain point. Because we burn enough that the trees won't, they just can't actually grow over. So it, it, if they do, it'll burn up those edges of the, of the tree line every single time. So there's this very natural kind of curve right around where we actually burn the charcoal. You're talking about you're burning it after it's been used? No, when we're burning it before. We actually, we actually sell it now at, the, at our distillery, which we didn't do until recently, and I think the only reason was is because uh, Elisa Henley, who works down there, um, and one of our new distillers actually, she's been working there forever, and she was, uh, I asked her one day, and I said, are well, you guys gonna start selling this charcoal? And she's like, well, if we sell the charcoal, I'm gonna be the one that's putting this in the back and selling it to people. You know, and that goes back to the fact we've only got 25 people that work at this distillery, so we don't have that many hands to do a lot of things. So it was a, she's like, I don't want to have to put these in the bags every day. Don't give anyone this idea. Well, I guess somebody heard it because now, now she and I. Last time I saw it, I was like, so she who's doing that? She's like, I'm doing it. Yes. <laughs> this is not like me. No, right she's now. not. She's not like me right now. Oh, yeah, we'll quick, let's taste some whiskey. Yeah, let's taste some whiskey. Uh, so let's talk yeah. about some aging and what happens. Yeah, after. yeah. So it's yeah, this is the George Dickel number eight. Same exact whiskey. What I like to as we as we taste through the progression, which we'll do a little bit faster because I know we're probably close on timing now. Um, they give us a full hour, so we actually. Okay. So um, <laughs> this this is the exact same. That foundation whiskey, that same base. The only difference is is that after the charcoal filtration. We stop the process. We cut it from what is 117 proof for the charcoal down to 90, um, down to 91 for the Dickel White. Now, when we go to the barrel, we we actually cut it down to 115, from 117 down to 115. We put it in a barrel and we and we put it up in our warehouses. So this is a five to seven year old whiskey, um, still young enough that what I'm tasting still is all that very bold 
oak barrel flavor profile. This is the one out of the whole line that is more like a bourbon than anything else there because it still has that kind of boldness. It still has that very prominent caramel vanilla, everything else. This is the one that definitely stands out to high sugar content as far as anything you're mixing with it because it's got that bite. It's got what I call the backbone to the whiskey and I think it's this is like the down home whiskey. I say that like if my only statement for the evening, which may be tonight, um, is I'm drinking whiskey tonight. That's it, right? That's the only thing to say. This is what you probably want it to taste like. Very traditional, very typical flavor profile, but it works in a lot of different ways. Do you, do you guys uh, louder at all, or do, you, or do you distill the whole mash? Do you separate any of the salads out before the split? Uh, no, we don't. We distill the whole mash, yeah. Can you reference the numbers? As far as, as far as Why are you not number two? Oh, right. Yeah, so uh, George Tickle number eight, as far as where the actual number comes from, like everybody else, it's kind of a little bit of a lore. Uh, there's a couple stories out there. Um, what, what seems the most logical to me is that if, if we were all distilling whiskey together and we were taking the concept where you're pulling from different ages and blending those barrels together, you're, gonna, you're not gonna get it right on the first time. So we're gonna end up having a certain range of, of blind tastes that we're gonna kind of go through and we're gonna land on which one it is. So that number can be referenced there. Uh, I've also heard uh, taxation numbers, bonded warehouse numbers, um, and there is actually the third one, which is less romantic, but it's out there in the world. Um, and I, it's hard not to believe him because uh, Mike Beach, again, from his book, he's a fantastic historian. Um, there was there was some documentation that said it could have been as simple as a public opinion poll when they reopened the distillery <laughs> as far as what the numbers were. But they, you know that's just not as uh, it's not as romantic. It's the south. It's so. So there's so there's, there's, not not there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's not a there's not yeah that that was completely no, lost through. Perfect. It was yeah. referenced before and it was referenced here. yeah so. So so things started to change there. <laughs> So uh, 1800s, 1870s, pot stills uh, were replaced uh, with more advanced column stills. So obviously, if you're up in the uh, Appalachian Mountains, you're probably still using your tiny little still. But the bigger guys like Greenbrier and Jack and uh, the Cascade Hollow Distillery, they started switching to a column still, which allows them to produce, obviously, larger quantities of whiskey. Um, so those are some big changes. And some big things. So whiskey actually starts to really start to thrive for a small little bit of time. Um, we really started producing a lot. Tennessee has a huge concentration of distilleries. You know, there's a couple of hundreds of distilleries actually happening at that point. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, Second Avenue, uh, there's retailers and merchants, there's like bars set up just for the, all the gentlemen that are the distillers. Um, obviously, and then there's a the ladies of the evening all also there, you know, all that stuff starts to happen. But one of my favorite facts, the Springfield National Bank was actually created just to work with the distillers. And the average deposit, and this we're talking the 1800s, was $100,000. That was the average deposit. So like literally, that's who their main customer was it. That's all they dealt with was distillers, and that was their average deposit. So obviously, making whiskey was a good business to be in. Um, and ladies, unfortunately, we're the people who little bit. We're the people who killed it. <laughs> um, we're one of the main reasons. But before we get there, um, so I know there's some things going on with George Dickel at this moment in time. Yeah, so where are we at here? 1888. So yeah, George, so after he met his wife, um, and moved down to the Cascade, uh, Cascade Hollow, and so the Cascade Distillery grabs a white bottle. It's bottled under the George A. Dickel Company name, but it wasn't actually called George Dickel. It was still the Cascade Whiskey. Um, and when George passed away, it was actually when they, they kept the mantle. His wife and her brothers was able to hold on to the George A. Dickel and Company name, and they made that more prominent on the bottle. So all of a sudden, that kind of shift in what you were calling it changed from Cascade to um, George Dickel and Company, or George Dickel Tennessee Whiskey. And so it didn't actually happen until he passed away. And it's funny, you know, George passed away because he fell off his horse and died of medical complications. It's a very similar story to the fact that uh, Mr. Daniels also died of medical complications. So he kicked the kicked, still. Right, kicked the, kicked the safe. Safe. Yeah. safe. Safe. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, and they said if they actually just drank their whiskey, they might have actually survived. Or like on their wounds. Foot, yeah, or, on their wounds, yeah. so. Um, but, you know, the moral of the story is, is that you did, really didn't want to get hurt in the late 1800s. Or drink more whiskey. Right, or drink more whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So speaking of more whiskey, so this is one of my favorites, the, the number 12, which is, I think is the signature of all things uh, for Dickel. Yeah, well, you know, number eight is the most classic, um, for sure, uh, and traditional, but number 12 is, it's a 90 proof whiskey, it's still the exact same mash bill, but you're looking at seven to nine years versus five to seven. So a couple more years, and all of a sudden it drastically changes where it softens out, the, that bold kind of backbone, those those very bold oak flavors kind of soften down a little bit, and I get more of that toasted note. I mean, I work with a guy actually um, who uh, likes to describe this like drinking a bowl of cornflakes. It's got that, it's corn is still very, very present, but in a sweet nature, but the way that cornflakes isn't actually a sweetened cereal, you know, it's that toasted corn, very natural, sweet, that still comes out of it, and it has to do with the fact that you get that very nice toasted nature from the oak barrel from seven to nine years. So and it is 90 proof as well, so um, has just enough structure to it. This is definitely um, what I see more in the market as I go across the country. It's definitely used more in bars and restaurants than um, <coughs> any of the other ones besides probably the rye. It's just um, a good sipping whiskey. It is a really good sipping Like me, it's, it's great for cocktails. But it's 12, whiskey. rock, splash of water, and I can have two of them at the end of the night. We yeah. found it on our local Walmart, and I was like so excited. Like, oh my God, Walmart, has it. Walmart has Dickel. We've come a long way. <laughs> so uh, selling whiskey starts to get harder because, well, ladies, we have a big influence on that because we're still not happy that we're producing whiskey and all stuff. And I know we don't have a lot of time. What's our cutoff time? About five minutes ago. Okay. Hey, you told me I had until one. So. All right, well, one. A one on three. All right, so. Anyway, all right, so we'll go a little faster. So we'll, we'll test right. So the government gets involved, they start putting more taxes on it, it gets to get a little harder to make whiskey. Uh, well, it's not harder to make whiskey, it's that they're pretty much just saying, you know what, you're gonna make whiskey, we're gonna start putting a lot of taxes on it, we're gonna put your money. The, the bad thing is what happens in Tennessee is that district number four is actually the, the district that's using the Lincoln County process and they're very proud of their whiskey, where district number five is not. But they don't, it's too much work for them to have two districts, so they actually combine the two together. And that's where I actually heard some of the numbers came from, was also the districts in which they were in. Um, so they're actually forced to uh, be blended together. But there's also about how they're taxing them. They're taxing them on what they, they say that uh, making whiskey should only take three days. If you um, use the Lincoln County process and also having leaders, you're getting taxed on like you should be able to produce like three liters of whiskey from every batch of corn. Um, if you use Lincoln County, you only produce 2.5, so that was a big deal. And also, it was taking them, if you use sour mash, it takes five days. So there's a lot of fighting going on between the government and the uh, liquor distillers. Um, but some good things happened. So basically, um, the bonded period came, so basically it meant they were only getting taxed on their liquor that was in there. They used to get just tax. The minute you started distilling, you got taxed on your, your spirits. Um, now you're allowed to actually keep it in the warehouse and you didn't get taxed. So first start off one year and after one year you got taxed on what you had. Then it got to five, then eight, then eventually went to 20. So it meant as a distiller you could actually hold on to your whiskey and you weren't getting taxed until you actually bottled it and sold it. So you could actually then pay the money back because you actually made money yourself. So that was some good stuff. Um, banning sale of liquor to minors was also put into place, so not giving the five-year-old a bottle of booze, that's good. Um, the bottling act happens, basically, if you need to, this is the, to keep it uh, pure. They said that you, if you distill, you need to then bottle at your own warehouse, and it has to be sealed. So that meant no impurities can go into the bottle. And also the Pure Food Act started coming into place where literally they actually had to start labeling stuff that said like this is what's actually in the package <laughs> and it actually had to be the real shit. So that's good for all of us. Uh, but then that lovely lady came into play, uh, Carrie Nation. Um, so it already started, I said, way before that. Um, the First Temperance Society also, I mean, literally it's getting preached at you in church all day. Like the priests are just telling you, you're bad, bad people if you drink. Um, they join up with the, the priest. She's going around hatching with other women and they're, you know, breaking up bars and restaurants. It's just not good. Um, the, but the biggest thing that really put a damper on it was the four mile law, which said you cannot sell liquor within four miles of a, uh, any sort of institution, any school. And if you had five, first it was like within a town that had 5,000 people. So that really like people, everybody is shut down. You cannot distill or sell any alcohol within five miles or four miles of a school. 
So in 5,000 people, they just, so everybody had to shut down, a lot of people had to shut down. And then eventually it moved to 2,000 people. When that happened, we went down to four distilleries. From like, you know, 100 to four. So uh, basically, Tennessee eventually went dry. Because they just, there was just no way that you could stay, and still to this day, suffering from that. Um, and then basically, um, Jack and Dickel pretty much pick up and leave town because they realize they're trying to escape prohibition. So they actually move and they start to move down the town. So they actually, uh, Jack Daniels moves to St. Louis. Uh, George Dickel moves to Kentucky. Uh, starts producing in the famous Tittuola distillery. Um, and basically, you know, but eventually, obviously, as we all know, prohibition hits the entire country. So they start moving away from prohibition, but eventually it catches up to them. So post prohibition, I know we have to go quickly, but go go quick, Tim. Yeah, that's fine. I think I, we, I have a lot of stuff already, already, so the, you can just go to. Can wait for lunch, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, we gotta get everybody <laughs> fed <laughs> as quickly as possible. Uh, yeah. You can just yeah, we'll just <laughs> roll through that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. We're, I mean, as we talk about the history, basically, as we can go through. Um, Tennessee Prohibition comes down and it stops It stops all the distillers there. And it happened before the rest of the country. Um, as you see when they skip town, what's actually kind of relevant for Dickel is the fact that when we went to, um, when we went to Kentucky, we started uh, making Cascade Whiskey. Uh, Cascade Whiskey ended up being very big for a, a little bit of time and was reopened back when Prohibition was repealed um, and was selling until the Dickel Distillery was rebuilt. So actually in the early 50s, Cascade Whiskey was selling actually 500,000 cases in the U.S., which was pretty big for that time period. That's um, selling now. What? That's less. Than, that's much much higher than what Dickel's selling now. Um, so, uh, but what's what's kind of important as far as the brand goes, though, is that the fact that Tennessee Prohibition and then we didn't reopen until 1959. So that's a huge gap in American history. Things like basically the concept of national celebrity, right? People paying attention to things on a national level. We did not catch on to that very quickly, um, and the distillery wasn't open, and I think that definitely attributes to why it is um, a much smaller, smaller brand still to this day, but what it did well, and you can go all the way to the, yeah, we can go through all of that to the whiskey. I think that sounds good. Um, so what, what I think was really important about it was the fact that because we reopened in 1959, we really haven't changed anything. So taking away from this, you know that most of the equipment that we are using today, besides our quality lab, is still from 1959. What does that mean? It means no computers. Everything's done by hand. You know, when I referenced earlier, there's 25 people that work there. There's a man in every part in the process. You know, we're not pressing a button on a computer. There's a guy at our mash shop, so if he's got to regulate the temperature on the mash, he's turning the wheel on the steam valve in order to change that if he sees it goes up. He's going to go over there and he knows it because he knows that piece of equipment. So it's about that connection, that human element to the whiskey, I think is very important. It's important in craftsmanship in general, whether it's behind the bar, whether it's making whiskey, whether it's woodworking, whatever it is, the human element of doing it by hand definitely adds some level of quality and some level of romance. And I think that that's really important for, for whiskey as well. So what we have here is uh, the George Dickel Barrel Select. I like, I like just talking. Yeah. Uh, so the Barrel Select, is the last one and embodies that sipping whiskey quality. I mean, this whiskey is so easy to drink, it's going to get you into trouble. Yeah. It's like <laughs> the finish just disappears for me, and I'm ready to have another sip. There's some big, bold whiskeys out there, but this is one where you don't need a break, you don't need a sip of water. You take a sip and you take another one. This is sitting on your front porch. That's what Tennessee whiskey is about, and I think that's the big thing. Is that that's what I want people to walk away with. Kentucky versus Tennessee is that this is all sipping casual whiskey. I think we should just finish but actually the law, so yeah. now Tennessee yeah. whiskey makes it a little bit different. Because there are definitely things that define like what makes Tennessee whiskey Tennessee whiskey versus a like, Kentucky whiskey. There are definitely some uh, yeah. things that are in controversy lately, but uh, these are the ones. Oh, it's all controversy. There you go. Uh, Should I put them all up there? Right. So, <coughs> Sorry. So <laughs> this is this is. Do you know which which ones Tennessee and which ones bourbon? No, it doesn't really matter because these are the exact same thing here. Federal government, the North American Free Trade Agreement, just says that a Tennessee whiskey is a straight bourbon made in the state of Tennessee. So the only difference is an appellation. Uh, but the, the state itself did uh, put into place very recently, actually, that they added one more part to it. So it's not a federal regulation like bourbon is, it's just a state regulation, but it's about production and where they're coming from. So you're already going to be Tennessee because you're in Tennessee, 
and out of East Tennessee, you also have to filter through Tennessee's sugar maple charcoal. There's only one distillery that doesn't do it, so it's Tennessee whiskey on the label. Does anybody know what that is? Yeah. Pritchard's, right? So Phil Pritchard, um, very prominent. He's been, he's been making family owned whiskey for a very, very long time. And when this law was passed, he was able to go there and actually talk to the legislators and everyone else and say, you know, I, I'm from Tennessee. This is still Tennessee whiskey to me. And they were able to say, you know, you've been you've been doing this, yeah, exactly, grandfathered in because he's been doing it the same way for a long time. Um, and I think that's very important. And I think that's it's inclusive. Being inclusive, I think, is I think the most important thing when you when you come up with a law and something like this as well. So, um, is that is that the end of our? I think so. Did, yeah. did you say that it had to be straight whiskey? Straight bourbon made, yeah. Straight bourbon made, straight bourbon made in the state of Tennessee is, is the uh, is the actual definition from the North American Free Trade Agreement. So there is, there's an age. It's got to be at least two years. Two years. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. exactly. I know we have to go. Was there any questions? We can hang out as they in the back as well. If you guys have extra questions, we're going to be here. Um, yeah. And thank you so much. And how about a cheers with the. Uh,